Hello class. We'll be starting a new chapter right now. We're going to be looking at quadratic functions. Actually, this next chapter, what we'll be doing is looking at properties of quadratic functions, understanding the characteristics, and then actually in the next chapter we'll be looking at how we solve quadratic uh, equations. But today, uh, it's kind of a nice lesson. It, we're going to be looking at transformations of quadratic functions, and in a sense we've already actually done this. Um, so, in some ways, this is going to be a review of stuff that we've been doing, uh, this whole concept of transfer, transforming functions. Uh, we'll be looking at specifically today in terms of quadratic functions. Uh, it will be a nice kind of review of what we've been doing since I know that transformations as a whole is kind of a, a new thing for us. So, we're going to be looking at... Uh, uh, we're going to describe quadratic transformations by looking at an equation. And then, kind of opposite, we're going to write equations uh, that have some sort of transformation on a quadratic equation. So let's first of all uh, define what do we mean by a quadratic function. A quadratic function is any function that can be written in this form here. This is one definition. I also like this definition as well. It's any sort of uh, transformation, and, and by that I mean these limited transformations, horizontal and vertical translations, stretches, and, and shrinks, and reflections uh, of this parent function f of x equals x squared. And then uh, here's yet another very kind of standard definition of a quadratic function. It's any function that can be written in this form ax squared plus bx plus c. So any of these definitions actually would suffice in terms of defining a quadratic function. As we start this whole kind of topic about transforming quadratics, let's kind of review and, and be reminded by this chart um, uh, that we've, we've put together. And as we look at this example, um, this is a quadratic function, and we can say that, uh, according to this chart, we see that it's a horizontal translation, and it's going to be a horizontal translation to the right because we have minus 2. So h in this case, right here, h is 2, a horizontal shift to the right. So we take our parent graph, and in our parent graph we have, you know, this parabola, we have this point right here, 0, 0, we have this point here, 1, 1, we have this point here, 2, 4. These are kind of very convenient points. I'll actually label them here, 0, 0, um, uh, 1, 1, and 2, 4. Very useful points to kind of get uh, used to when you're drawing quadratics. Now, as we shift this over by 2, uh, this vertex moved over here. And then from this vertex point, um, because we're not stretching it or anything, we go across by 1 and we go up by 1. Just like over here, we went across by 1 and up by 1. I could also draw this another point um, going across by 2 from the vertex, across by 2, and up by 4, and now we have the translated uh, uh, parabola, translated quadratic function. In this case, we have a slightly, you know, more complicated case where we have two translations going on. We see this inside part here, which is going to be our horizontal translation, this time to the left, and then we also have on top of it this uh, piece right here that's going to be telling us we have a vertical uh, translation downward. So if we were to look at this graphically, we start with our parent function right here, and then looking at our vertex, our vertex went uh, from the 0, 0, it went to the left by 1, and went down by 2. And then from the vertex point, since we're not stretching it again in any ways, uh, we can go across 1, up 1, across 2, up 4, and we now have the shape of this new parabola over here. Okay, let's look at a, a case now where we're shifting this, or, or vertically stretching it. So, in this case, this is uh, the case right here, where the factor of our stretch is 2. Vertical stretch. So, again, we start with our parent graph. And now, when we do this, we're all these points here, um, you know, 1, 1 gets vertically stretched to 1, 2. 2 comma 4 gets vertically stretched to 2 comma 8. So let me just 
kind of write both the old value, 1 comma 1, and the new value, 1 comma 2, where uh, the y value gets multiplied by 2. 1 becomes 2, 4 becomes 8. Uh, so let me label those as well. We had 2 comma 4, and it turned into up here 4 comma 8. And you notice the vertex doesn't move, not because vertical stretches don't move vertexes, but because the vertex is on the x-axis, uh, the vertex has a y value of 0 when we multiply it by, you know, 0 times 2, it, it just doesn't go anywhere. So here's our stretched uh, parabola. Another case, let's look at this one. In this case, we see we have going on a one-half vertical stretch, followed by a translation up by 3. So we can graph this as well in the same way. We're going to do the uh, uh, translation up by 3. And from this point here, we're going to be plotting out some other points. So instead of, since we have a vertical stretch of one-half, um, we go out by 1 here, but instead of going up by 1, we go across by 1 and only up by 1 half. We go across by 2, and instead of going up by 4, we go across by 2 and only go up by 2. We go up half that amount. And then we connect this dot, these dots together, and you see that this parabola is a little wider than the parent graph right here. Okay, here's an example where we're doing a reflection on a um, horizontally shifted or shrunk uh, parent graph. So again, horizontal shrink of, of 2. Remember, the, sorry, I, I used the word stretch earlier. Uh, when we see this 1 half value inside the parentheses, you know, inside the square function, um, we actually have to think about it being the reciprocal since a horizontal shrink, this is a horizontal kind of shrink or stretch case, uh, we see the, the factor of one-half, the reciprocal of it being two. Okay, so in this case here, um, it's going to be reflected down as well as horizontally stretched. So normally, we would have a point going across by one and down by one, since we're reflecting down, but since we're stretching it horizontally, this point would come out one more. So instead of being at one, uh, 1, negative 1, it will be at 1, negative 2. So we have these points that are stretched out horizontally. And again, for this case, normally we would, have, we would go out by 2 and down by 4, but this point here would be stretched horizontally out by a factor of 2. So now we have this graph. <clears throat> now here's a kind of an interesting note. If we were to write this, um, you know, let's forget about the reflection for now, as one half x quantity squared, we could rewrite this as one fourth x squared. And if so, so if we look at this case here, it would seem like it's a horizontal stretch with a factor of two. But if we look at it in this form here, we would actually interpret this as a vertical stretch or vertical shrink by a factor of one fourth. And in fact, these are equivalent. Since these are equivalent statements, these are equivalent as well. For quadratic functions, um, a horizontal stretch of factor 2 is actually equivalent to a vertical shrink of factor 1 fourth. And, and we could do that with other values here as well, but this is one specific value. And so, yeah, in, in some ways we can't actually say, you know, equivocally that uh, this graph here is a horizontal shrink. We can actually interpret it also as a vertical shrink as well. Okay, let's go back. We have this uh, form. This is how we defined our quadratic. Um, let me say that uh, this is a very, very useful form because from this form we can pull out two things very quickly. We can understand the shape of the parabola by the a factor. We know how much it is either stretch or shrunk, and we also know whether it's being reflected across the, the uh, uh, whether it's going up or whether it's going down, I should say. 
And then from the H and the K, we can easily, quickly pull out the vertex of the parabola. So that's why this, we call this vertex form, because it's so convenient to pull out the vertex from, this, from the uh, equation when written in this form. It's kind of like when we have um, y is equal to mx plus b. This is a very useful form because all of a sudden we know where the line is. It has an intercept at b, and we know the slope has slope m. But So in vertex form, say we have this equation, and it is in vertex form, immediately we know two things. We know that the vertex is at 4, 3, and we also know that it's upside down, it's, it's going to have a, uh, a downward shape, and it's going to be vertically stretched by a factor of 2. So if we were to draw this out, we could quickly kind of sketch it out, uh, going across by 4, going up by 3. We know that's where the vertex is, and we know it's going to be going downward. And, and this is just a, a real quick sketch, it's not super accurate but this gives us a very quick read on how the graph should be looking. Okay, let's go the opposite direction. Let's write some equations based upon some described transformation. So given the starting parent function, let's define a new function that is reflected, vertically stretched by 3, by a factor of 3, translated up by 2, and left by 6. So, using vertex form, we can actually quickly see that the a value is going to be negative because it's reflected, and also vertically stretched by 3, so that's going to give us a value of 3 here, as w followed by a translation of 2 up, that gives us our k value, and our h value, because it's going to the left, h is actually negative 6. So, plugging this in, we have... Uh, our equation for our quadratic, this is our a value of negative 3, x minus h, x plus 6, this means a left translation, and plus 2, this means an up, upward translation. So again, vertex form is a very cool and convenient form. Last example. Uh, here's a little more uh, complicated example where we have this function h of x is a uh, more complicated looking thing, 2x squared plus 3x. And we want to write a new function that has been translated up by 3, or sorry, right by 3 and up by 4, and then after that we want to reflect it over the y-axis. So we're going to take it in two steps. First we'll do the, the first step, the translation, and we could do this all in one step. Um, the new function is going to be h of x, the original function, um, translated to the right, so x minus 3 achieves that. Up by 4, the plus 4 on the outside of the function achieves that. And so let's kind of simplify this. Let's plug this into here. And now we have this. So let me just kind of show you here how we got that. We have the um, 2 right here. We're plugging in the x minus 3 into this x, so we have x minus 3 quantity squared, uh, plus 3x, plus 3 right here, and again we're plugging in the x minus 3 right here, and then lastly um, we have this plus 4 portion here, and we see we put that plus 4 portion right there. So we're going to just do some kind of expansion and simplification. We get our translated function t of x. Step 2, we're going to do the reflection over the y-axis. The y-axis, when we do that reflection, it's going to be a horizontal type of reflection where things go back and forth across the y. So if it's horizontal, we're doing things inside the input of the function. So this will be a, a minus x inside. So taking this function, we have 2 right here. Um, negative, we're plugging in the negative x here because this is t of negative x minus 9, and again we're plugging in the negative x here, plus 13, that comes from right here. So again we just kind of simplify this, and we get our final function m that has uh, been both translated and also reflected. Okay, that's our lesson for today. You can go ahead and do these problems now, or you can kind of wait till tomorrow, we'll do them in class. Okay, have a good day.